Hello, and welcome to the NextNet Infrastructure Modernization Podcast. Here on AIM, we invite industry professionals and subject matter experts on to discuss current trends and technology topics. Today, we will be talking about data-centric zero trust with Racktop. Joining me today is Dave Hughes, Lead Solutions Architect from Racktop, and Vic Simon, Senior Solutions Architect here at Annexinet. Gentlemen, how are we doing today? Not bad, thank you. Doing well, Chris, thanks. Dave, just to get us started, can you give us a little background on Racktop? What is this company? Where did it come from? How long have you guys been around? Sure, so we're a company that delivers a security platform that focuses on cybersecurity and compliance. So really what we're doing is we're extending zero trust into the data center by securing the data where it lives. And that just so happens to be on storage. So we're protecting the data at the storage layer. Let's say I've been here at Racktop for three years. We've been in business for going on 13 years and a lot, a lot of the heavier focus has been around the cybersecurity in the federal sector. But we have had commercial customers all along. But the biggest focus, of course, when you're looking at insider threat and detecting that and how to stop that, your biggest customer is the federal government. Our system was built by NSA engineers that came out of the three-letter agencies and really wanted to see how they can design and architect a solution that is, one, flexible from a deployment perspective and is expandable and can actually move into the commercial sector when it was ready. And it just so happens the past three years, the commercial sector has actually opened up the doors and said, we need help. We feel that every customer should have the capability of protecting the data like it was a national secret. Well, I, I, if you talk to certain CEOs, they will absolutely think that their data is a national secret, at least it, it is to them. Oh, yeah, of course it is. It's like, <laughs> that's their bread and butter. And if they get, they're charged with protecting it. If something happens to it, whether it gets deleted or moved or somebody can't find it, you know, of course, the customer or the users are going to say, hey, it's your job to know where everything's at and get it all back online. And now the, the bigger threat is that there's external entities trying to steal and compromise it or lock it down so you can't have access to it with ransomware. Now the big new thing is, of course, extortionware. So it's always about how do you stop that insider threat or stop that ransom in the beginning and be a preventative capability versus a reactionary, like a backup software would have to for recovery purposes. If something got compromised, I need to know immediately who it was, what it was, where it came from, what they, they touched, and you know, all those components need to be right up front. The backup softwares and some of the other softwares that are out there are kind of reactionary where it says, hey, I need to know this, but it's only until you've asked it. We're on the front end where we're telling you right away when it does happen. So that way you can stop an Edward Snowden level event. You can actually stop him from leaving his chair versus waiting a few weeks and finding out all your data is actually a home WikiLeaks. So that's kind of what we set out to do is stop that insider theft or insider threat, as well as really focusing on on the commercial sector, the stopping of ransomware as it happens in real time and only stopping the person or persons affected versus shutting down the entire organization and leaving them crippled so they can't work or continue business. So we call that cyber resiliency and making sure that we can pr still provide data while being under attack. So, so Dave, if, you know, from the reading that I've done, you know, the way I look at Racktop is Basically, I mean, because you mentioned backup, you mentioned cybersecurity, you mentioned a whole bunch of different verticals that, you know, we all touch in, the, in this industry. The reading I've done and the research I've done with you guys and the work I've done with you guys at a couple of client sites already, you guys really are more of a software-defined NAS solution that started with a security first and a zero trust methodology and then built off of that, as opposed to some of the other big hitters, which have storage solutions and NAS devices or whatever, and then sort of bolt on the security and the feature sets sort of as sort of as an afterthought. Right. Yeah. So even Gartner even says like network attached storage and scale file systems, they don't provide adequate protection nowadays for malicious deletion or encryption of data anymore. What they've kind of actually designed or built out is cyber storage. And that's what we call our system as well, cyber storage for that NAS data, which provides active defense against cyber attacks for that unstructured, unwatched data area in that NAS network. Because let's face it, the bad guys aren't trying to steal your network. They're not trying to steal the switching. They're not trying to steal that stuff. Those, those peripherals that are out there, those are their accesses in. The bad guys are after the data. That's what you care about. That's what a customer cares about. That's what I care about. Somebody gains access to my data. You know, what do I do? I've seen companies pay upwards of two to $3 million for 800 gigs. And that's not a lot of data. 
but they oh, paid God. 800 gigs just because they don't know what's contained in there. They don't know how exposed they are just based on that little bit of storage, that little bit of data. So big emphasis on protecting that data from the inside out approach. That's where, of course, we really focus on that. And a lot of other storage products, they kind of, they feel like, oh, the endpoints, the edge protection, they'll, they'll just continue doing it. Gardner is telling us, as well as other third party people out there, that that's not a good enough anymore. We really need to start really looking at how do we get closer and bringing those protections closer to that data stream. You hit it right on the head. I mean, the standard security posture and profile and general go-to methodology has always been protect against multiple threat vectors through multiple layers and always starting at the edge. Because if you think back, you know, a lot of the big data breaches that, you know, first started happening a couple of years ago, were coming in through the IP connected chillers or the PDU systems, specifically thinking about the CBS breach. Now, to your point, they're going to get through one of those access points. You can't plug all the access points. So the only way to really ensure that you have security at the data layer is by keeping that security point as close to the data as possible. That's exactly right. As well as the bad guys are getting smarter and smarter every day. And they're using things like, so look at the supply chain attacks. I mean, they're trying to inject themselves into software updates, backup software updates, anything that can get into in the supply chain. Um, if it's not secured, right? So they're leveraging those accounts. Think of um, SolarWinds, for instance. That was a classic one. Somebody got in, they got into the supply chain, into the stream itself for updates. And because that, that monitoring software has access to everything, everybody looked at it and said, hey, look, that looks like it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Until you start seeing, well, why is all my data being exfiltrated? But nobody was looking at the NAS. Nobody was looking at that unstructured data because we assume the endpoints are going to catch the bad guys. Again, the bad guys are getting more creative. They, they know and they start learning all the tricks and they start looking for additional ways around those types of areas. Well, yeah. I mean, when you, when you take a look at a lot of that stuff, you know, the, the malware comes in piecemeal. Yeah. And then compiles at a later date once it's all inside. You know, so that's and, how they're getting around a lot of monitoring software and systems. The day zero event is actually the, the day zero. It's actually yeah. weeks or months before that. The big thing is I worked at a multinational law firm around the IT department. And we had bought a lot of security because we were in charge of protecting our clients' information and data. Every customer came in, every client we onboarded, we went through security audits around their data and protection of their data. And one of the big things that we looked at was, well, how do we look at the actual NAS system? Because every one of the audits would come through where, how do you protect the data? If I give you this information, which is incriminating to me, how do I know that you're not going to let it out? How do I know that you don't have somebody on the inside that's willing to take this and sell it to somebody else? How do I know who's doing that chain of custody, who's chain, chain of command? But the NAS, the system itself could not do it. It was just a big gaping five petabyte deep, dark hole that our security guys would freak out about because the storage guys didn't want to give anybody access. And the network guys were like, well, or the security guys were like, we need to protect it. I mean, we're in charge of making sure nobody walks off with this stuff. It's a disaster when you're trying to look at that, that, that much content. And those systems are so much faster now these days that if somebody did get a breach in, like you said, it takes months. They're just casing the place. They're walking around, looking at what cameras, you know, not you know, <laughs> visually. They're casing, they're pinging things. What do I have access to? What systems do I have access to? That's them or that software casing the infrastructure so they understand it and then coordinate an attack. Once the attack begins, you'll know it because all of a sudden everything's unaccessible and somebody's saying, hey, it's, uh, somebody wants 30 Bitcoin. $60,000 a coin. I don't, I don't know how many people actually have that kind of money in the bank. Another thing about the bad guys, they're smarter too. They actually understand the business you're in. So they'll know if 30 Bitcoins too much or is five Bitcoin just right. These are coordinated attacks by office buildings full of people. Some of it being state sponsored. Exactly. Which is, which is real scary because now they, they have unlimited bank rolls. So Dave, we've sort of gone over, you know, what the, what the threats are. And, you know, I, I think everyone in this industry, if they even have one finger on the pulse of what's going on, sort of gets all this. So how specifically does Racktop address a lot of these issues? 
Well, we, we manufacture a product called Brickstore OS or a Brickstore NAS cybersecurity system. And, and it's a storage platform that is software defined. So being able to deliver storage and that security capability built into that storage, we can deliver those essential features and functions to modernize that production NAS, right? So that system is now a cyber system that can actually provide information on what's happening with the data in real time with our capabilities called user behavior and threat detection response, so active defense. All those pieces are built in that. So we're delivering all those security features through basically file shares inside of the NFS and SMB protocols. It's transparent to an end user. There's nothing that we install in anybody's infrastructure. It's all housed within the storage subsystem itself. So zero impact to performance. Users have no idea that anything's happening security-wise in the background. And we get all this telemetry information of exactly who, what, when, where, why. Every single thing that comes and goes through that door to access a file is being recorded for compliancy purposes. So, so basically, from the sounds of it, you've taken some rich user data and telemetry data and married that with an AI engine that tracks and creates user profiles and performance profiles based on the data access patterns. And then basically married that to a zero trust methodology, if I'm hearing you right. Yeah, there's a lot of secret sauce and intellectual property built into that <laughs> stack. So well, it's kind of, I promise I won't ask. <laughs> it's a lot of stuff that it is difficult to go through. But we, we call them assessors. And an assessor in our system is basically just like a credit card industry would. If I was out charging all day long with my brand new credit card that I just got, and I stick within the same mall. The credit card industry says, okay, well, Dave Hughes goes to the mall. He's in this, the same zip code he usually shops in, and he's in the vicinity of his credit card. Next thing you know, I get a text message on my phone saying, hey, we just caught a charge in China. Was this you? Do you want us to stop it, or do you want us to continue? And I know that I'm not in China. I didn't charge anything in, in China, but they see something abnormal from my characteristics or my spending behavior, so they basically stop that event from occurring. They proactively stop that. And, that, and that's what we're doing at the data layer, right? So if we see something that is suspect, we're going to stop that user and make them respond or you know, have somebody trust but verify. This user, Sally, was just doing this. She came in through the firewall, but she's also connected over here in the same spot, accessing more information somewhere else. So we're going to stop access to that unusual behavior and for Sally to call the support desk or basically the security team would verify that, hey, um, are you connected to the firewall? Are you accessing this information and data? If not, we're going to have to you know, have you change your passwords, those things like, you know, things like that, because your account's been compromised. What really strikes me as interesting on that is, uh, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. And whenever a suspected breach or suspected abnormal app behavior has been uh, identified, a, it's usually too late. It's been going on for at least a couple hours before someone gets dialed in and, and looking at the problem once it's been identified. But typically the response is shut it all down. Shut down the external yeah. pipes, <laughs> lock it down. Let's figure out what's going on. And then we'll start gradually turning the spigot back on and, and reintroducing users. Well, it's not so, even that. It's, it's, it's even worse than that. I've actually been involved in several of those Walk through that whole thing. If you were to get compromised, what's your first thing you're going to do? So basically, you know, if we saw something abnormal, if we saw something, once it was identified, which, you know, that could take an hour, two hours, maybe a day even, depending upon how it's set up. You know, the first thing we do is we, we run into the data center and start just jacking cables out of the back of everything. Yeah. So one step below it, the EPO. It's, it's worse than that. I mean, it's not just, oh, the cables are out and we're going to, you know, turn everything on gradually to kind of figure out where it was came, coming from. I've seen backup software technology saying, no, the first step you do is start recovering everything. And you, I don't know if you've ever had to go through a full system restore. Once or twice. Okay. And, and look at the time frame you, from start to finish. That outage window is a huge disruption. You're sending everybody home because nobody can work. You've turned everything off. They can't function. They can't work. You also can't sell anything or provide services for anything. I had, I guess, even at the, the law firm, we were down for a week, wireless, just the wireless system was down for a week. And you know how much money we attributed to that is whether the lawyers could not bill, how much a lawyer makes per hour, the attorney teams, 
multiply that by how many attorneys we have per day, how much they make. I mean, there was millions of dollars lost per day revenue wise because they couldn't bill. Plus, we're also paying all the employees to sit around, and do nothing. They can't access the network is gone. There's no access to anything. So just th that disruption. Now think of what a cyber attack is. Now we're only down and out because we unplugged everything. We're turning things on gracefully and then you know, recovering everything from backup software with fingers crossed that we can actually recover things because you're only as good as your last backup. And if you've tested it. Now you've got to figure out where the, where the malware injected itself. Yeah. Because you, you could be restoring the malware. Well, you got the, you, they got the secret service and FBI down your throat saying, where, what, what happened? And what did it affect? And you, I throw your hands up. I don't know. Everything's turned off. <laughs> what do you want me to do? Until we actually go through this, which could be months on end, to get back to a stable state, to bring people back to work and actually do this. Because And then you look at your DR plan. It's the essential functions that the, the DR plan plays off. It doesn't think about all, you know, the, the a thousand employees that are, you know, truck drivers and those types of things. It has a huge effect. A ransomware event or an insider threat, these types of cyber events are huge disruptors. They cost a lot of money. And if you're in the, the, the business where you host people's or have access to people's information, my security number, uh, social security number, my, you know, mortgage information. Now you're looking at all the costs that, what is it, LifeLock? <laughs> you got to pay for LifeLock subscriptions for a year for all those people. Yep. And how, I mean, I don't understand even like the, I mean, I keep hearing stories of these, the insurance companies now, you know, not wanting or, you know, dropping the coverage and doing all kinds of things to make it harder is how do you prove you aren't negligent? How do you show that? Yes, we're watching this. Yes, we are proactive around these things. There is a lawsuit right now in a healthcare industry down in Florida that because they were down, and this is a big one right here, they were down because of a cyber attack, a little baby lost his life. That healthcare institute is under legal action because allegedly they did not provide adequate security for the information data. Think of heart attack patients, stroke patients. They need, it's minutes to react to this information. If, I, if a doctor doesn't have access to the EKGs or the imaging systems for a stroke patient, within minutes, that person's life's on the line. Well, don't forget all the, all the pharmacy stuff is now IP connected as well. Oh my, it's just, it's, it's so, there's so much stuff that the healthcare industry is, there's a huge need. I mean, everybody has a need. Anybody that holds any type of information, <laughs> there's so many scary things out there. Let's, let's talk about this one in the federal community. How do you know that the Raptor engine, somebody didn't move a weld three inches to the right? Can you prove to me that the file did not change? We, we sent that CAD design out to this welding you know, shop out in Missouri. They're in charge with uh, welding this one little thing that was the very critical part for the Raptor. And um, somebody may have gotten into their infrastructure and moved that weld, didn't, didn't destroy it, didn't delete it, didn't do anything, you know, to encrypt it or, you know, hold, take it offline so they can't access it. No, they changed it. So that way, three years from now, the entire fleet of, you know, our Air Force is, you know, having to do more maintenance or the, half the, the uh, infrastructure is down. It's costing us money from the, from a military standpoint or an outage and downtime. That's a scary thing. I'll take that to the commercial world, change blood type. That's a real thing. How do you, how do you show who did what? That's what our so, system can do. That's what really spun me up when I started really diving into what Racktop can do is it, it changes the whole response tactics and paradigm of how we respond to these incidents because we're no longer doing the, the mass unplug or the mass EPO or the mass power down. It, it's now, we, you know, the, the system is smart enough to have identified an anomaly and basically fenced that anomaly off. Until someone can get in there and go, yeah, we were doing a, a data move or a backup or seeding another system or something of that nature, an ETL, something that, that you know, warrants that type of, of abnormal behavior. And it it's really is the, one of the first systems that has these characteristics and features built into the product. They're not bolt-ons. No, nothing's bolt. Everything's built in into the system, that was like one of the big things when this was originally architected by my CEO and, and my co-founders, uh, Jonathan Halstutch and Eric uh, Bednash. 
when they originally set out the design this one, we had everything table stakes wise, you need to be secure, you need to be fast, you, to, you know, all those capabilities, a storage pl enterprise storage platform has to have DD of compression, storage efficiencies has to be there 100%. That's just table stakes. Anybody that's an enterprise storage player you should have those. But 100%, we have to have without impacting any performance, all these security features on top of that. That is going to be, and it is still today, the only thing that is our differentiation in the market. Nobody else can do what we can do in the storage sector around data security and, and access and stopping ransomware in real time. People are trying to do certain things and starting to think about that. Most people are more, you know, I would think they're, I mean, I've seen a lot of different things. I'm around on LinkedIn. A lot of those storage companies are more focused in the racing world. That's cool. They can do race cars and bicycling, but they don't secure data. I see other ones that are really focused on Kubernetes. That's really great. And virtualization is really, that's really great. We're focused on cybersecurity. That is our differentiator. Well, it is not just ransomware. I mean, you sort of alluded to it a little earlier, but it's also that insider threat. Yes. You know, if you've got, if you have someone sitting in payroll that's accessing engineering files, that throws up a red flag. Or vice, or vice versa, versa. The guy in engineering is accessing the payroll files. Exactly. I want to know how much Cindy's getting paid because I don't think she does enough. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Again, that when I really started diving down and reading into it and, and, and looking at what you guys offer, first of all, you know, the NAS community has been somewhat, I'll call it stale in the commercial environment Yeah. for the last couple of years. Not a lot of innovation in a small entry point to something that scales to massive size. There's a couple, you know, entities out there that are really, really good, but you're going to start at half a petabyte. Yeah. That's one of the, the one things so because we're, we're flexible and well, in our licensing, right? So uh, our licensing gives us the capability and we're software defined. We just, we charge on usable terabytes, what you actually get to use. So if you get 10 terabytes out of one terabyte, you only get charged for that one terabyte. I mean, we, that's how we actually do our licensing. And we can start as small as one terabyte. And I just got off the phone earlier with two other you know, state and local agencies. They don't have a lot of data. They have a lot of scattered locations, but they, they have they don't have anything centralized. So you got the public safety, you got the police and fire, you got you know the courthouse. Each one of them has 30 terabytes. Some of those scale-out systems out there does not address their problem. They have a lot of cybersecurity compliance needs around in-centered threat there too. I architect systems on a daily basis, and it is getting harder and harder and harder to develop even a single server with yeah. just a terabyte of protected storage. Well, it, it's well, you know, of course, drives, they're just exceeding you know, the technology is now growing faster than what we're producing, for, I guess, some, in some of these. Now, the TikToks of the world, and they're, just kind of, they're producing lots of multimedia and stuff out there. But I mean, I, I tell you one thing, it was kind of funny. I, and I've worked in storage all my life, but uh, the storage efficiencies like dedupe and compression that came out, and then, of course, everybody was look focused on application. And unwatched in the background is, is Internet of Things. They kept warning us, Internet of Things. And of course, you know, because that's all telemetry, information coming from everywhere. And where does it get stored? Where does it go? And how do you access it? Then, of course, NAS data. I mean, the NAS systems have, kind of, like I said, stayed kind of stale. But that's where you put your bulk of your information, your home directories, your file shares, all those kind of people that's sharing those information. It's, you know, SharePoint can do some of that, but it's, it's still, it's an application. So, of course, a lot of the technology has gone into, let's focus on virtualization and compression and deduplication and that, and, and really kind of shrinking the storage footprint for vir virtual machines. Now, I don't know about you, but I, like I guess I had a 7,000 attorney firm. We had five petabytes just in Washington, D.C. We had another eight petabytes in Dallas. We had a bunch. We had all, all over the world, like three petabytes in, in China and all kinds of different things. I think I only had 16 terabytes of virtual machines. 16 terabytes. That's how much my applications, how much storage they consumed. The bulk of that information was case information, data, you know, legal information and, and that kind of stuff, all the ingest that we would do. That, that's where the bulk of the data was. It would be read one time, it'd go into an application, a database, so they could do these things, but we still had to maintain and hold on to that data. Then this firm has, of course, have been around for, I want to say probably over 50 years. <laughs> so there's data and information that data scan documents in, that they don't even have access to these clients anymore, that they still had to maintain these records for. Think of the healthcare industry. That's another one. You get an x-ray or you get a CAT CT scan or something like that. I just went through all this last this year. So, you know, how often do you see your doctor? You see him every day? No. You see him every once a month? 
He wants to do twice a year, but I'm pushing off to once a year. But <laughs> yeah, let's see, try that. It's kind of hard to do once a year now. But I, I got a CT scan. They reviewed it once. And now because of my medical, I will need that CT scan for the remainder of my life. Actually, life that any seven. one of my doctors that I go to in the, in the future have access to my medical history information. They can see what was done or what needs to be done. Stuff And, and a CT scan. That's that big machine with the big uh, the magnets in it. It, it was like seven gigs um, for a, like a two minute, not even a two minute video. Mm-hmm. Very big video, very, very large file for just like less than two minutes. And you know how many patients come through those doors a day, a month, a year? That data adds up. It's got oh, my name. Ab- absolutely. But, but to your point, it's not just the legal field or the medical field anymore that, that has these life plus seven or seven year retention policies on data. You're starting to see this coming down from um, regulations on almost every industry has some form of regulation that requires some form of retention on sensitive data. LIDAR is another one. And, and, so- God, and God forbid if you get breached, because yeah. now they're starting to talk about mandatory reporting. Another industry, of course, to note is, is definitely the, the energy sector. Um, mm-hmm. They're going around and taking these, these images, these LiDAR images of telephone poles and, and these poles. And, I mean, just high resolution, very large information of data down to telephone poles. They have systems that record all the, all the telemetry information from the dams that actually you know, generate electricity from the hydropower. Railroad tracks. It's, there's so <laughs> much that's being generated now. I can see where a lot of scale out helps out, but you can't put a scale out right beside one of these small plants that are totally isolated from everything else. You, you don't, one, they don't have the money to go do that. It's impractical. I need 20, 30, 40, 100 terabytes, probably in less. And some, some company, because we, we scale from one terabyte to, you know, to up to a couple hundred petabytes, depending on architecture wise. So, I mean, but we, we don't have a limit where you can start at. We can also do virtually. So if you wanted to run our system in a cloud, if you have cloud first initiative, that's, that's another thing we can, we can actually install on pretty much every single hypervisor out there, all the popular hypervisors at least. And, and that's a, a big thing that we're doing as well is we're giving that software to our end users for free to try it out. They can install it in their data center, try it out in their data, make sure it's a fit first. That's that 90 day test drive, right? Yeah, we have something called a jumpstart. Yep. So it's called the jumpstart program. We actually do that soup to nuts. We help the customer. We don't just hand you a piece of software and walk off. No, we actually sit down with you. We install it with you, configure it, whether that's a Hyper-V, VMware, KVM, Nutanix, AHV, Hyper-V, anything. Cloud as well. So if you have AWS or Azure, we'll install it there for free. And you can really give it a full test run with all the feature functionality. If you have two locations, we'll let you have that as well. Go ahead. You want, we really want you to try it out. Go ahead and do replication disaster recovery. We gave you that. So you can really test it out. And we put you under 24-7 support. So you have, you're fully supported for production environment under that Jumpstart program. That's unheard of. And, and one of the, a unique thing, I'll tell you what, it's actually kind of cool. We have a, a healthcare industry out in the, on the West Coast. And they heard about the Jumpstart. And they said, hey, can, we would definitely like to try it out. We were hit by a ransomware a few months ago, and we're looking for a solution to take all our edge offices, all the, the clinics, because each one of them have about 10, 15 terabytes, and we, we don't have all the money in the world. We've already invested heavily on hyperconverged environments, and everybody's running a Windows virtual machine, and that, that Windows operating system the most, the most susceptible OS on the planet to ransomware, anything that you can think about Windows is kind of happening with Windows. But we said, sure, you know, how many do you need? So they took, they bit off on 20 virtual appliances. Go ahead. We'll help you install it. We'll show you how to do the first one. We configured it, did a bunch of knowledge transfer and training, really spent the time with them. And within, when they started migrating the data over to, during that, we got an alert for, you know, one of our customers called us in and said, hey, we got a problem. We have NetWalker. The brick store just stopped a NetWalker incident. It was the same ransomware attack we had. We didn't know, but it still resides in our infrastructure. I mean, I've, I've never been on a call with 15 you know, security people at the same time. They were very adamant, very, very uh, thorough. But we, we helped them discover that 
they didn't actually clean up from the, the previous cyber attack that they you know, had to pay ransomware for. They had to pay them pay money to get access to their data back. They actually didn't clean it up good enough. We showed them where all the little outliers were because they started moving that data in. And we, it's under our protection within minutes. They started, as soon as that data hit our system and users started accessing it again, we identified and detected who it was, where it was coming from. We isolated it down to one of the, the locations. It was a very intense you know, moment when within minutes, we detected that it was free for them. And they definitely purchased quite a bit of storage uh, for uh, over 150 different locations to put the brick store and uh, virtual plants in place of the Windows file share system that everybody just virtualizes a Windows machine and puts it on their hyper-converged because there's no good you know, solution for that right now. So we, we with that free solution that they got the test drive out, it was proof within three days that 100% our stuff worked. We detected a threat and they were able to stop it from uh, further infecting or you know, bring them down again. Well, and, and what, what's what's really nice about your systems is is not only the detection piece of it, but the ability to identify where a good point is to restore from, as well as the options that you guys give in terms of what to do with that infected file or the affected user. Yeah. And maybe we go, go into that a little bit, because I think, you know, being able to do some forensics after the fact is starting to become just as important as detecting and mitigating the issue. Yeah, I did a kind of, I did a video on YouTube. It kind of, it kind of shows that what we built in, it wasn't just good enough that we can stop it. It's like, as you're sitting there, you're thinking about, you know, from start to finish and what you have to do for in a disaster or, or, or an audit when something does happen to you, like one of these events, you know, who, did, who was it, where did it come from and what did it affect? Since we're in that data stream where we know exactly what user, what location, the IP address of the system that they access that data file or encrypted that file. We record all that information and then we can show you because we in that tracking system, that uh, active defense area or inside their GUI, we treat it like a case from start to finish. We even time you what was the uh, return to business, right? How fast did, we, did it take to catch it? Okay, it encrypted three or four files. We know exactly what those files were. The storage admin has the access to recover those files and knows exactly what files were compromised. The security team that could triage that, of course, because we're sending alerts to the security team because we're a sensor around the security. The security team knows, I need to go out to Cindy's desktop. I need to lock it down. I need to change her password. We need to give Cindy some training. So there's, there's things that happen in the background, but the storage system's running that kind of playbook. They, you can recover the data bring that data back online, all while not affecting all the other users. We didn't run to the data center. We were, our hair wasn't on fire. We're all up and running. Nobody is the wiser. We're, we're under attack, but we're not sweating it because we can actually keep the lights on, keep custom, keep users online and not have to take them all offline. Once everything's been recovered, because we can do that for based on our snapshots and everything's policy-based, a policy-based engine in our system. Everything's done through a security policy and compliance policies. So once all that's wrapped up and done, you can then close the case out and return that, that single user back to service again. It's, it's a hard kind of to visualize verbally, but I do have a video out on YouTube. Just look at the you know, active defense with the brick store uh, rack top systems. And that will give you start to finish a good visual on, you know, it takes minutes to, uh, to address or to respond to a ransomware or an insider threat versus it could have been nine months long. You've been under attack the entire time and now you don't even know where to start. And your backup software, again, how many months do you keep on your backup system? How long has it been overwritten now? Well, That's you know, thing as, you, as you and I were sort of talking before we started this, um, backups should be used as an absolute last resort. Yeah, I, I read an article. <laughs> it's kind of funny because uh, it's even like the backup industry. And one, one of these smart CEOs basically said, hey, look, you know, we're doing all we can. And, and working in, as a backup and protecting the data, you know, that's, that's what we're specializing in doing. Why are you looking at the backup industry to protect you from ransomware? You know, if it's gotten to the backup, it's already too late for you. 
the IT industry really needs to look at you know, the prevention part. We're, we want to be in the game of stopping a patient before they've had a heart attack, identifying those pieces, putting the right prescription in place to prevent them from going through that pain and suffering. So we're on that preventative side of the house and we're also in the middle. So inside the, we can you know, watch everything, prevent things, we can stop the ransomware, but we can also help recover from that ransomware. And we know exactly what was affected. If you're at the backup software, you're already, it's, you're already, you know, day late and a dollar short. So I think he, even as I'll throw my air quotes up, he said an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And that was, that was actually one of the coolest articles I've read. I don't want to throw that, you know, the names out there, but if you probably Google it and find it out there on um, LinkedIn. But as like finally somebody's owning off and saying, okay, the, the backup software, the backup industry is just, it's, it's taking customers down the wrong line or line, line of thinking. We need to be preventative against these things, not think our backup software doesn't stop ransomware. Backup software doesn't prevent insider threat. Well, I mean, let's be honest, the, the industry up until recently really wasn't tooled up or architected for these type of attacks. We have been, we have been for a while. Of course, we just, we, well, we just have the big marketing stick that <laughs> these no, I'm, well, I'm talking in general, I mean, but that, again, that's why I'm, you know, super excited and stoked about this partnership that an Exonet and Racktop is sort of forming here because this gives me the tools that I need to service my customers much, much better. And it's really easy. I mean, it's, it's NAS, it's not rocket science, but we brought, we brought the coolness back to NAS again, which is kind of, I, it did, it, it, it gets stale. You said it earlier, storage and NAS got stale. It's, you know, who cares about it? This is one of the technologies that I thought needed to be revamped for a long time. And Absolutely. when I found Racktop, I was like, I got to be here. This is a rocket ship. This will be a necessity in a few years. So Dave, we're, we're coming up on, on the top of the hour here. Do you, uh, any parting thoughts, words of wisdom? If any of your listeners would like to actually try out what we're talking or see that, I mean, by all means, head over to our website and right on the, the front page, there's a button that you can click. It says, try out the jumpstart. It's free. It, it gave you 100%. You work with a 100, uh, a, a really awesome engineer, probably myself. But I, I, even, I love doing the jump starts. And if, if, it, if it's great and it works for you, if you care about security around your data, you need us. And I, and I believe it's pretty much everybody out there in the industry. They do care about the security on their data. But go ahead, try it, try it out. We'll give it to you. We'll let you try it out. If you, if you don't like it, it doesn't add any value, turn it off. It, it's no big deal. But if it does, we'll definitely help you. And, and along with you guys over at Nexonet, help with the install and configuration training to make sure it fits. Uh, absolutely. Dave, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Chris, I know you've been hanging out there somewhere. Chris, you've been quiet. I said all I needed to say. <laughs> <laughs> This has been the Anexonet Infrastructure Modernization Podcast, a production of Anexonet. Subscribe for free through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite listening app. Let's keep the conversation going. Follow us on social media, visit us online at anexonet.com, or contact us at info at anexonet.com. Anexonet, empowering what's next. <laughs>